The U.S. government has made moves to regulate the usage of NFTs with the BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act. Stay tuned. Welcome to Coffee Plus Studio, the podcast where we talk about music, metaverse, NFTs, and more. And today we are talking more with Nima, the lawyer. Hello, Nima. Can you hear me? Nima is in Morocco. I can hear you loud and clear. Fantastic, fantastic. Yes, I am. So, Nima, this morning I was in your DMs. Thank you for coming so quickly. You came. You, of course, as always, are my dream friend and my real friend and my dream guest because I said, can you come and do a podcast about this breaking news, this alpha that you just dropped? You said, give me 15 minutes. I said, a professional after my own heart, just like me, like, just give me 15 minutes. Let's go. So, Nima, can you drop the news that you dropped to me this morning. I'm still not quite a newbie, not quite an expert. I'm somewhere in the middle, but this news was something that we had to get out of actually popping out this podcast as breaking news today. It's not waiting. <laughs> Go ahead. Perfect. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite a pressing development and we want to share it with everyone. So, uh, you know, Congress has, has received a proposal to uh, add NFTs to the Bank Secrecy Act and to generally uh, money laundering regulations. So uh, this is a this is a new step forward in in terms of monitoring the industry from the government standpoint. Uh, the government's taken a very laissez-faire or hands-off approach on the industry as a whole for the past few years. Uh, uh, mainly because um, they were trying to see what 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 can they understand more about the nature of NFTs, and they were doing their own independent researches with uh, several several independent bodies. But uh, yeah, this is this is quite an important development. So art galleries are going to have to have um, BSA anti money laundering compliance. Uh, there's something Pretty, called yeah. BSA, where BSA, people, yeah. BSA meaning Bank Secrecy Act, correct? BSA stands for the, right. The BSA is the law that stands for the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, and it, it generally guides you that you need to um, have a, a appointed officer that is the main point of contact for government officials to inquire about uh, suspected uh, fraudulent behavior on your platform, uh, you need to have rules and policies in place in order to ensure that um, you know your your platform, the NFTs on the platform, and other features of your platform are not being misused uh, in order to siphon funds or to uh, engage in a pattern of uh, of uh, suspicious behaviors. So you have to file suspicious activity reports when you, when and if you see suspicious behaviors and your and your entire staff needs to be trained and versed on um, just what is suspicious. And so, you know, this is something that art galleries need to be cognizant of. There's something called art fraud where um, in the past people would create fake receipts, fake bills of lading that would uh, over overstate the value of certain paintings or certain sculptures or certain physical arts and they would uh they would even uh create receipts for fake sculptures uh duplicative sculptures uh and then sell them at the uh at the you know the authentic sculptures price so that they can wash dirty money and then sell it for clean money uh so this is this is a new uh, means of combating the digital space. Uh, is is that the BSA will now come now will now apply to NFTs? How how can they apply themselves to a decentralized situation, especially in terms of fraudulent activity 
which the spammers in the space are crazy, but we know if we're in the space every day, we immediately can spot a spammer. That's one. Number two, there are there is so much coding written on the platforms in regards to fraudulent images. Like I've accidentally uploaded um, my own image twice and it rejected me. It was my own image, but I was not supposed to upload it to a second, either upload it twice or upload it to another platform. It rejected my image because there's so much coding. How we we've already put in our own fraudulent activity, right? How is how is a bank, how is the government coming in to be able to monitor this? How? How it's uh, based on their their jurisdiction. So technically, if you're a citizen of a country, you're a national of a country, you engage in business in that country, you're subject to commerce laws of that country. The Department of Commerce, uh, through its Office of Foreign Assets Control, you know, and, and BIS Bureau of Industry and Security, they monitor everything that's coming in and out of the country uh, from the physical perspective, at least historically, and they question whether those those you know acts of commerce would um, endanger national security. So uh, money laundering is very complicated. Okay, so you can use proxy actors. Um, you know, a, a government or a state actor can can give dirty money or money uh, you know unclaimed uh, to a private actor, and that private actor can. Um, by the next people or the next NFT for an exorbitant amount of money. And that can oversaturate the market and it can, it can injure a lot of consumers right. uh, in the short term. So, you know, the, the federal trade commission has, uh, you know, is, is uh, definitely a part of this and they have um, procedures, they have laws that, that basically delineate the procedures you need to follow to determine uh, just what type of platform you are and w just what type of disclosures you need to make. Uh, and, and then furthermore, out outside of disclosures, outside of your terms and conditions, there needs to be an internal uh, mechanism that is, co that is efficiently collecting every uh, suspicious behavior that's taken place on your platform so that if and when the government needs to come in and investigate, they don't have to upend your entire business operation. They don't have to look in places that they're not entitled to look. So actually, so, it's, uh, it's quite a, it's quite an encouraging thing. It's a trust building <laughs> thing. And in some ways, it improves your business's uh, uh, throughput and its productivity and its profitability. Okay. Do you think that there's just going to be a gut emotional reaction sort of like I had to the government um, putting in a regulation regarding NFTs? Or do you think people will process it as something that is needed in the space? Yeah, I think that people are definitely going to be skeptic at first, uh, just because they had this, this, uh, these several years of, of non-regulation. And of course, regulations uh, take effect from the day that they're passed onward. So anything that you've done up until now will not be subject to these new regulations. And so people will not like change. Uh, oftentimes when it comes from the regulatory side, people are skeptic of their own governments. Are there governments um, asking more, more than what is required for, for business to thrive? Is this gonna be a, a barrier to business? And uh, simply put, it's, it's not gonna, I don't think it's gonna be a barrier. I mean, historically, um, yeah, money service businesses, e-check businesses, businesses that would uh, transfer money overseas, they were subject to the same regulations. So anytime you um, yeah, anytime you transfer $20 for to support your friend's uh, cryptocurrency project overseas, uh, your friend who is a 3D artist and you, you transfer it with Remitly or with Payoneer or with one of these services, well, Guess what? Those platforms that are transferring that twenty dollars over several thousand times a day, they have 
uh, they have the same program. They, ha they have to comply with BSA. They have to comply with anti-money laundering uh, laws. They have to have a robust anti-money laundering program or else they're going to be subject to penalties. And that's historically been shown that, uh, you know, Payoneer was recently had a settlement with OFAC uh, not too long ago for violation of uh, the BSA and anti-money laundering uh, laws in other countries. So this is, this is the point. Um, you know, NFTs, uh, not all NFTs are going to have the potential to be a means of transfer of, of, of monetary value uh, necessarily by their nature. But that's not to, that's not a good enough reason for us not to start regulating the industry, because if we allow bad actors to transfer money from other countries to the US, then we're allowing illicit behaviors to happen. More crime is going to be on the streets, more, uh, you know, uh, human trafficking is going to take place. Uh, other illegal activities will take place. I don't want to go too far into it, but that's really the intent of this law. Uh, and, and we should all, you know, be aware. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I appreciate you coming on to my podcast so quickly to share that bit of news. And so let's move a little bit onwards to your app. Can you tell us a little bit, first of all, give us a little bit of bio about who you are, because we dove right into the news. And then tell us about your legal app and how it is combating legal disparities. Sure. So just some background, um, you know, I, I uh, graduated law school 10 years ago, started out in financial investigations, uh, exactly the, the, you know, the flip side of this. I used to go out, I used to go after the bad actors that would be charged with fraud that would have federal cases against them pending uh, for money laundering. And typically they would use real estate as a front to transfer wealth and real estate projects would be ridden with uh, millions of dollars from narcos from uh, illegal state actors mm -hmm. and so i you know starting out in the investigatory standpoint I, I i saw a lot of the bad things early on and then i started moving uh, about five years ago six years ago into crypto and into transactional work in general transactional work uh, setting up the corporations, uh, setting up their compliant programs, seeing what they need, uh, what, what they need to check off in terms of their respective, uh, you know, business practices as to what is considered suspicious or not. Uh, and then training a chief compliance officer or CCO in order to maintain, uh, longevity of that company's project and, and mission. Uh, and then I, you know, I worked with a lot of product teams. So in software, so I'm a technology lawyer. Uh, I'm a high technology and space lawyer now, so I basically advise applications from inception to completion. And uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I've been working on uh, a variety of different technology projects with their product teams, and their product teams would essentially, you know, define their goals, and then I would find the legal means by which to meet those goals because oftentimes. Softwares, they're not just built in one country and subject to one country's laws. Right. They are built all, with teams from all over the world that have their own data use, data transfer laws. They might be subject to the CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act in the U.S., the GDPR, uh, you know, which is the equivalent in, in Europe, um, and, and many other uh, regionally based uh, information laws. So when you're using consumers information, um, you're, you're going to have to, uh, when you're using consumers information, you're going to have to make sure that you disclose from the offset what you're doing with that information and whether you're going to resell that information to third parties and what are they going to do with that information as well? Those third parties. So there's, you know, in the age of AI, in the age of, uh, derivative analysis of data, you're not, right. you're not quite, you're not quite sure what your information is going to be used for now and in the future, right? Especially so, when we add that additional layer uh, of something that's uh, near and dear to me, health information. 
health information is one of those, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it, so you, you can, you can kind of, even health information can be used for fintech apps. See, Correct. so like a, mm-hmm. a lot, a lot of, a lot of these, uh, these new startups in the tech space, they're trying to find a way of reaching more consumers. So the, the new generation, uh, of, of, um, you know, entrepreneurs are, are not necess- they don't necessarily have a social security number. They don't necessarily mm-hmm. have a credit score. They don't mm-hmm. necessarily have uh, a phone bill. Uh, they, they don't necessarily have a lot of things that can, that can rate them uh, from the know your customers perspective. So they need, they need to look towards other data sources and, and startups often compile um, emails, uh, reviews. Reviews are a big one. Um, and other, you know, social media behaviors, uh, likes towards certain other businesses, mm-hmm. uh, and aggregate that data in order to create a risk profile and a preference profile for, for users that they've never met yet. But they want to they want to target a certain product to that individual because they feel like that individual wants to buy it. So, it's it's uh it, it's going to open up. Well, it's a good thing because, you know, when you factor that maybe. 20 30 percent of the population at any given time in the u.s is an immigrant population mm-hmm. uh you know a transient population so right. you want to be able to target them and and you know give them access to basic consumer capabilities mm-hmm. uh that every that everyone uses on a day-to-day basis so this is the point of it uh we need to regulate we need, we need to uh, respect regulation first of all and respect the lawyers that do regulation don't say just go figure it out go deal with this headache mm-hmm. no you need to have a conversation from the executive level down and really internalize what the regulations are saying so that if and when a, a, a government entity approaches you you have some type of meaningful response right you have yes. some type of meaningful understanding about what place you hold in this ecosystem that is web3 okay and and web3 is the definition of web3 is constantly evolving and it will evolve even more uh nfts will evolve even more we're just in the beginning of what understanding what nfts the utility that they serve from a data science perspective when you say that everything is decentralized um that's chaotic so how do you you know yeah yeah there are decentralized uh you know information that you can now you can now as a, as an individual, you can go search for it. Um, you can be your own vigilante. You can even start. <laughs> you can even start. You can <laughs> um, obsessing. You're like you can even start obsessing over the behaviors of one address wallet tied to one individual and create an Instagram about that, and that's public knowledge. Uh, that's the benefit: is that there are I'm, many. I'm fighting. I'm hyper- fighting. I'm fighting with my wallets right now. <laughs> Where are That's you? That's a benefit, but 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 you know the other thing. The other flip side is not everything, because from the privacy standpoint, you don't want to have a hundred percent of your life on the blockchain, right? Never never do want that. Um, no, no. It's, it's, but some people are pushing for that. They're pushing for um, buying your house on the blockchain, uh, putting your school. Well, look, that- Putting all of That's, your information on the blockchain. That has a viable argument because if you're going to start registering properties on the blockchain, well, just so you know, historically speaking, many governments have been put into power historically and have reorganized the property rights of their respective countries and regions of the world and have basically excluded certain previous, um, you know, previous actors from inheriting those properties. So blockchain would be a great use case for solidifying who owns what property in what countries of the world, especially outside of the U.S. Because in the U.S., at least there is an effective court system and there is, you know, so there's a doctrine you're... called adverse possession that you can clearly, you know, uh, delineate. But in other countries, you can very well lose what is a 
fifth your, generation your first, property. Your first nation rights or your indigenous rights to your land. So what you're right. saying is you're about to become an indigenous lawyer and teach every <laughs> tribe of the U.S. how to blockchain their land. Is that what you're saying? You just became a indigenous rights lawyer on top of being a space lawyer? You're amazing. <laughs> You know, I just follow I just follow the the path, the natural path to to solving problems and mm -hmm. problems don't exist just on the ground anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, problems, problems exist in space. And, uh, you know, a lot of problems on the ground can be solved from space. And that's another thing. It's like democratizing the access to telecommunications, both on the ground and in space. What does that do for, uh, you know, these new these new bold startups that want to that want to solve existential problems that want to yeah. solve over pollution yeah. right human trafficking uh so many so many different things so you've brought th up that's human, why I, you've brought up human trafficking twice and so um i want to tell people it's a real thing it's not a political thing people are using no. it in a political way i have been a share ride driver and I have interrupted assaults on women. I have uh, not, uh, I have been solicited <laughs> myself as a writer, uh, people thinking that I am younger than I am and that I yeah, engage in that. Yeah, it's a real that. thing. And, and I've seen a young girl who was trafficked, you know, who didn't, who didn't have the wherewithal to know that they were trafficked. They had a learning disability yeah, I, I and didn't mean, know they a, were It's trafficked. a real thing. It's a really big problem. There's probably, yeah, there's, there's probably 20 million people around the world each year that are in some way uh, trafficked. So it sounds like egregious. Like who, how, what 20 million people are, are that, you know, uh, let's say ignorant to the realities that they would be trafficked. Well, it's actually a very elaborate means by which trafficking takes place so they'll offer you uh, a very co uh, high compensation for an employment opportunity just uh one hour away from where you live all right and then right you, you have know, to be just graduated from high where you live you're gone you're gone in minutes <laughs> i always right. tell yeah, my from child that one hour uh, point of meeting so right. i you tell go, my you child go to another country and then you're not seen Right. I tell, um, you know, and then we also have the disparity of depending on, unfortunately, depending on your race, how important your disappearance is. Meaning, you know, we lost, unfortunately, we lost that poor young woman uh, to violence in the desert uh, with her boyfriend. And then her boyfriend went into, you know, the wilds of Florida and took his own life. And it was very tragic. And, you know, people traced her and found her via social media and people were obsessed. My issue was that no one was obsessed with the 100 missing girls from D.C. the previous year. A hundred people aren't obsessed with the uh, missing women and indigenous women um, throughout the United States. And so <clears throat> I always want people to keep that same energy. You know, have you looked for, uh, you know, when people create this political thing about you're being, you know, they were being trafficked. They were being trafficked. They're missing. They were about to go missing. Keep that same energy and go find some uh, women of color. Go find some, go look for some indigenous women. You know, look look across the spectrum for uh, children, missing children, missing women of the rainbow. Keep the same energy that you have about this subject. Take away the politicalness of it and um, go join a team looking for someone in the desert. You know, just keep that same energy because it is it is an issue in the states. It's an issue for any city that has large sporting events. You know, we're at high risk, we're at high alert. Even as a share ride driver, we learned and took training about what events at high risk for trafficking, what to look out for. And I've seen it, I've been a witness to it, I've intervened in it. I've um, asked people if they need help, I've made people blink. <laughs> I've asked the question, do you feel safe? Are you safe? Can I help you? Come here, I will, here's my number, I will pick you up wherever. And so thank you for bringing that up into uh, the issue of the re re real regulation 
why they're doing it. So you're talking about your app law, uh, lawonomics and how you are decreasing the disparity of people being able to access a lawyer. Can you talk just a little more about right. that? Explain it. Yeah, we want to hear about that. Sure. So, so our app, it's, uh, it's an access to justice project. Uh, it's an IOT project. So it's an internet of things project. We want to ideally set up kiosks in every major city center, uh, in every major courthouse, post office, uh, corporate lobby, and then just other points in the street, uh, so that people feel more encouraged to report, uh, you know, ac criminal activities and, or, um, you know, life impacting events. So the the point is to because at, at least at least um, you know five thousand or more there are five thousand or more criminal defendants a year a, a day sorry a day in every major city in America. Mm -hmm. So most sure. of those defendants they are they some of them are innocent and some of them just need a lawyer to represent that and they don't know the means to represent it themselves. Uh, they don't know how to talk to a prosecutor. They don't know how to present evidence. Uh, they don't know how to interpret a statute uh, or, a sentence, or a sentencing guideline before making a, a, a plea of guilty or not guilty. And so this app is mainly, a, it's a chat bot that uh, auto responds to certain basic questions and then it populates a, a, a profile on the individual. That profile is an encrypted profile it is accessible to the first lawyer that's available in their locality, in their zip code. Okay. And mm -hmm. so it, it allows for the matchmaking process between a client and a lawyer to happen a lot more fluidly and a lot more easily. Uh, and, and so that's been, you know, a personal passion project of mine because I, I worked in the criminal courts in Houston, Texas. I've seen the extent of injustices in the criminal justice system and I wanted to do something for the people to to uh, to the extent that I can. So I'm looking for a government technology investor, a GovTech investor, to, in order to uh, facilitate a nationwide project. Fantastic, fantastic. And then from our previous conversations from the beginning when i first entered the space i believe i interviewed you or i was supposed to interview you but i think one of my co-hosts did um you are also in i believe textiles correct yeah so Fashion. my my reason for being in textiles i grew up in new york city yeah i grew up in queens new york uh, coffee. So I, I grew up uh, at 14 years old meeting Damon John when he started wow. his first brand, FUBU. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I was actually um, really inspired by his his drive and towards the fashion space. And then I started doing my own research and I realized, well, fashion is the main industry that, that sustains populations. What is the one thing that you need to buy every few months in order to, you know, cover yourself or, you know, basic human necessity is, is fashion. And mm -hmm. so the way that business, uh, you know, fashion businesses today, uh, the, the, the main global brands are set up are not ESG friendly, meaning that they're not environmentally friendly, they're not socially right. friendly, and they don't mm -hmm. have the proper governance systems in order to maintain sustainability. Yes. A lot of the bigger brands, they're, they're burning uh, 90, 90, um, like 90 tons or to 900 tons of uh, excess clothing a year into the atmosphere. And then, you know, there are For people no reason. on the other side of the world that because they don't have, they don't meet the price point of those brands. Yeah. yeah just, no, because to maintain scarcity, there is no value in a product if there's over oversupply of it. So if they try to resell it in third world countries or in just, other countries in Canada, in Mexico, if they try to sell it in a near in, nearby country, um, they're going to dilute the value of their brand and then their new products will not be worth the price that they want to sell it for. And so I'm a public, I'm, I'm a public advocate for sustainable fashion, uh, meaning, you know, the, build, the development of new type of I 4.0 factories and locales that allow for the residents of those locales to uh, you know, start their own fashion brand with the help of 3D printers overnight. 
because that is the speed at which innovation demands it to be. And it is the, it is the means by which you can, you can build something sustainably is by sharing factories, sharing very intelligent factories. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always say, you know, one intelligent factory would be better than a hundred non-intelligent factories right. uh, or a hundred factories that demand thousands of uh, workforce and then drop them at the, at the, uh, you know, at the, at the end of a season uh, and leave them at their own will or at their own uh, peril. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that fashion plays a big part in our global economy. And the, the sooner we figure out how to build sustainable fashion brands for each country and that benefit the country in turn, um, the, the better off we'll all, we'll all be. Yeah, I think that you need a meeting with um, uh, Richard Atkins in Hong Kong, who is introducing NFTs to his genes so we can track and trace um, designs and create more checkpoints with fashion and make sure that uh, the fashion's not ending up in landfills, that we're keeping it green. We're tracing it. And um, yeah, I think that uh, meeting you in this Web3 space has been amazing. You always bring excellent knowledge. Thank you for bringing breaking news to us today. This is, I believe, just part one of the conversation. We will be seeing you in NFT Malam tomorrow live. I'm so excited. So I am saying that in my podcast because this podcast <laughs> is going up immediately and we will be seeing you tomorrow, September 29th at Malam Great. at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and 9 p.m. Singapore Time. And we're going to talk about all the things we talked about today. Nima Sedajian, is that right? Sadajian. Yes, Nima Sadajian. Sadajian. Nima Sadajian. We call him Nima the lawyer. You'll get it right Nima. one day. Sadajian. Nima the lawyer. It's easier. Sadajian. 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 Yeah. yeah. I just I just needed it one, yeah. one time. You know, I, I've I've fallen in love around the world. <laughs> it's, it's it'll not, only it's not take easy. me. It's not easy. I, I acknowledge Sidijian. that. No, I just have to, I just have to hear it properly. Sadijian. We haven't had coffee yet. You know, we've never had our coffee or our tea yet, you right. know, to seal our friendship into family yet. So you This was breaking you have, news, you know. You we have breaking news, right? You know. So I normally call you Nima the lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, but we have breaking news. We had to get that in there. <laughs> we're so excited to have you at NFT Malam tomorrow. And we're going to hear more about your law um presentation so we can get you that funding and get you sorted. So thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. I'm going to, um, uh, here at, here it. at, Coffee Plus Studio. With so many positive things happening in the Web3 space, we like to sort of dance it out to our song, Everything is Always Working Out for You. All right, everybody. To this special pop up breaking news of Coffee Plus Studio. Thank you, Nima Sadijian my favorite lawyer, one of my favorite people too in the Web3 space. And we will see you soon. Everything is working out for you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Nima. Much love. <laughs>